Hello, thanks for joining this presentation. Um, my name is Connor Ryan, and I'll be presenting on behalf of myself and my co-author Vasily Papastavro. And this presentation is about ethical standards for research on marine mammals. So by way of background, we believe that marine mammals are a particularly interesting case in terms of um, ethics and welfare um, for the following reasons. They have very strong social bonds and um, social structures. They've been found, uh, many of them have been found to be highly sentient. Many populations are also highly endangered and undergo transnational movements, um, some of them being very migratory. And being breath hole divers, it, um, it's quite challenging to um, anaesthetize them and generally very difficult to capture and handle them for um, e experiments involving wild animals. <clears throat> Another issue in our field, uh, which we will just touch on briefly, is the issue of parachute science, where foreign researchers do not properly involve local scientists. And this is something that's certainly a feature of marine mammal science generally. Early whale research was only possible on dead animals, uh, usually on whaling ships or involving stranded dead animals. And these days, there's lots of plenty of good non-invasive techniques to study marine mammals. And this list is not exhaustive, but these are the ones we think are perhaps uh, interesting to highlight. Um, although the, there are many techniques, uh, they're usually quite expensive and they involve ship time, which itself is quite expensive. Uh, so there's been a lot of recent developments in passive acoustics with the uh, improvement in uh, computing power. It's now possible to, to um, track individual animals by listening for them with hydrophones and to track their movements by eavesdropping on echolocation and clicks that they make. Uh, suction cup tags are really revolutionizing the field of study as well. I'm donning one here in this picture and they are non-invasive, although the approach to attaching the tag from a vessel can, could be uh, invasive, depending on how it's carried out. And this allows researchers to uh, reconstruct the dive profiles of marine mammals. Photo identification is a very uh, simple but effective tool to track individuals over time by documenting natural markings um, on their fins, for example. If you photograph them in multiple places, you can infer movement between those places. Theodolite tracking can be conducted from land or from vessels to monitor behavior, including um, uh, controlled exposure experiments involving wild animals. And drone image, uh, drones are uh, helping in uh, marine mammal research uh, a lot lately, um, both for imagery and videos from above to study behavior, but also to sample uh, blows um, and also to sample sat, scat and even DNA. The law regarding marine mammals is so complex that few scientists have a proper grasp of the ramifications in relation to their own research. Um, there are, uh, there's legislation at many levels, including international, regional, and national. Um, a, a clear example of this um, lack of understanding was uh, when the University of Aberdeen was uh, under scrutiny for uh, problematic research involving special permit scientific whaling and that they were involved in in 2003, um, where the head of life sciences at the university said that the special permit was agreed by member states of the International Whaling Commission, whereas in reality, um, the International Whaling Commission had condemned um, this special permit. International law is a particularly complex and evolving legal landscape uh, when it concerns marine mammals and it involves several bodies and organizations that have accrued decisions over their um, over their meetings which are often annual or, or biennial. Uh, some of these organizations have been in existence for half a century or so, and this is a lot of material to, to understand. And in the case of the International Whaling Commission, uh, if you stacked all the documents in a pile, they'd be about five meters high. Um, so they, in, these organizations involve many decisions um, to be interpreted by, by scientists. Um, one example that's probably very well known is the 1982 moratorium on commercial whaling 
Um, but the IWC has also, or the International Whaling Commission has also um, been Im um, involved in the designation of many uh, whale sanctuaries and a host of other decisions regarding regulation of whaling. Something that would probably be more familiar to a wider audience is CITES and marine mammals are usually listed in appendix one or two in, in CITES um, regarding the, lead, um, the transport of, of scientific specimens. And marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty and um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as migratory species. And there was an interesting court case a few years ago in the International Courts of Justice where Australia and New Zealand took Japan to the courts and um, the courts ruled that Japanese whaling in the Southern Ocean was not for the purposes of scientific research. This ruling has implications for scientific whaling elsewhere. Sometimes regional legislation is very difficult to interpret. For example, the United Kingdom initially interpreted the EU Habitats Directive as applying only to territorial seas, but um, uh, following a court case, it was ruled that it applies to 200 nautical miles um, to the entire economic exclusion zone. Um, a, a good example of a complex national legislation is the US Marine Mammal Protection Act. It's an unusual law in that it applies to US citizens um, within their own waters, but also um, outside US waters, for example, in the Southern Ocean and in international waters. So we recognize that uh, a poor understanding of um, ethics and legislation uh, is, is widespread in the field of marine mammal science. So we chose to um, focus on a single case study. And this was on contemporary whaling in Iceland in which scientists collaborate with the whaling companies for access to data or whale samples. Scientists were from four countries whose governments formally diplomatically objected to this whaling, um, but also funded the science. And this raises questions of whether the researchers undermined diplomatic efforts of their sponsoring governments towards ending this whaling. Um, we found 35 papers involving 56 institutions in 13 countries and ethical assessments were rarely conducted um, or declared in these papers. Um, the provenance of the samples was also not always declared and involved quite a bit of background research to, to figure out if indeed the samples were from whaling. Um, so those uh, 35 papers that we list will be, uh, should be seen as a minimum. These are the ones that we could identify with certainty. Um, studies were often inconsistent with the ethical standards of the home countries of these scientists um, and there's many ethical issues to consider. Um, though the researchers often struggle to see the ethical issues, they're certainly clearer to the press and to the public. Our aim in writing this paper was to start a debate and argue the case for ethical and legal guidelines to be adopted in our field. The only responses that we've received are from scientists who seem to want to shut down that debate by arguing that in the world of whaling research, anything goes. Um, long ago, the medical profession addressed issues of ethics in research, and now we argue that whale scientists need to do the same. Um, when our paper was submitted to one journal, it was rejected, and the um, reviewer comments were, were quite interesting and telling of the problem that, uh, that we're describing here. And um, reviewer one stated that for a policy paper, I think that you're much better of putting ethical issues aside since these are personal values. And reviewer two said, these examples seem really to show when academics and, in and institutions can be quite appropriately embarrassed by a lack of due diligence in their work rather than demonstrating any real legal or particular ethical issues. So um, yes, our uh, issues that we were raising were, were very much being dismissed there. And when the paper was finally published and um, it was um, presented by Hakai magazine, um, a journalist named Kieran Mulvaney, um, a quote from his article on our paper, um, it quoted a researcher who was cited in our paper as saying, not only would I not use such tissues again, but I would be happiest if no one did. So we take this as signs of, of gradual change, but we think there's much bigger change has to happen. 
and we look to the professional societies to, to lead on that. The big professional societies in our field are the Society for Marine Mammalogy and the European Cetacean Society. And when one examines their guidelines, they, the SMM provides no additional safeguard beyond that the research has to be legal. In fact, it actively encourages the use of tissues sourced from hunting, regardless of how that hunting was conducted. Indeed, it may be that some scientists can be so focused on the task at hand uh, with their research that they don't see the wider implications of their work until it gets into the public domain. And an example of this is where um, The Guardian ran with quite a damning headline about the University of St. Andrews. And this university was contracted by the Japanese Institute of Cetacean Research to do minke whale research, where some of the revenue um, to fund that research was generated through the sale of those whales killed. Another example where the um, members of the public were, were quite rightly shocked by some research was um, the confusion regarding a, a whale that washed up dead in Chile, uh, which had a, a tag, a satellite tag embedded in its blubber. Um, these are quite commonly used tags. They are the, the typical tag of, um, instrumented into whales these days. And the members of the public and journalists were quite rightly or quite understandably concerned that someone had attempted to harpoon and kill this whale. Um, so some of these commonly used methods are, are highly invasive and, and often they're hidden from view. Um, I think a good example of this was recently the, there was a WWF report, which is the largest review of whale telemetry um, or satellite telemetry of whales to date. Um, but in their report, there was not a single picture of a tag or any discussion about the methodology used um, with no descriptions of how these tags are, are fitted to the whales um, subdermally through their blubber and into the muscle layer or close to the muscle layer at times. Um, when seen by members of the public, um, these tags are um, obviously um, misinterpreted um, as attempted whaling. Um, the tag removal is neither planned nor possible, and it may remain embedded in the whale long after the tag is, is no longer functioning and potentially for the rest of the whale's life. Um, so poor or no ethical oversight can really undermine public confidence in the scientific process. Um, and can be highly damaging with long-term consequences for other fields of research. Another relevant example of this is when a, a tag manufacturing company tweeted an image showing how their whale tags are instrumented into whales, um, and they quickly deleted the tweet, which begs the question, uh, how come? And there are many case studies, and we just present a few of them here. Um, uh, Cases involving hoop netting of wild dolphins in Iceland, um, putting two tags on the one whale in, in Norway, trapping minke whales for hearing experiments, wild minke whales um, for hearing experiments in, in Norway, and in the case of uh, a Las Vegas dolphin amusement park, uh, where a study was conducted in which it was stated in the published paper in 2020 that participation by each dolphin was voluntary, which is, is quite absurd really. Other examples include researchers um, attempting to diversify the use of harp seal and minke whale meat as crab bait and testing the efficacy of these um, tissues in, um, as crab bait in, in a fishery. And also the use of um, deep blubber biopsies, so blubber sampling um, using uh, darted biopsy tips is, is quite a common in our field, um, but recently there's been uh, the use of deep blubber, blubber biopsy sampling where uh, in one case at least um, there was a study in which the sampling device was, was deeper than the tissue layer being sampled, so um, 10 centimeter blubber biopsies being used on killer whales when um, their blubber typically is uh, less than 10 centimeters, so it could potentially impact on their muscle or even bone layer if, it, um, if the shot goes to the wrong place. There are many more examples and um, this, this was just a quick summary to give you a kind of sense of um, what was unfortunately quite typical in our field. 
So some of the points uh, that I have discussed will be specific to marine mammals and others I hope you find will be more generally applicable, for example, to large terrestrial animals. Um, in terms of take home messages, uh, we'd like to highlight some key points where we think progress can be made. And firstly, uh, universities, funders, journals and permit issuers should require that ethical assessments um, be made, ones that are structured according to a predetermined format. Uh, secondly, the two professional marine mammal societies should work together to produce modern ethical guidance. And lastly, um, this guidance should require transparency in the provenance of samples and include advice on law, welfare issues, uh, involvement of local scientists and offshoring. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I will leave you in the capable hands of my colleague Vastili Papastavro and he will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.